one of the first questions that I have here is what's your favorite part about the Delaware water gap? Um, that's an easy question. It's always the river. Um, it's always been the river and it always probably will be the river. Um, it's my favorite place. Um, any day that I can get on or near the river, whether I'm at work or on a day off, um, sometimes even just getting a glimpse of it on my way from one place to another um, makes it a good day. Um, I think the other thing, though, that is really important and stands out to me about the park, it makes it um, a place that's a favorite for me. I grew up in the area, so this is home. I get to work in, in you know, in my home national park, so this is where I grew up. So it holds a lot of special meaning for me. Um, and one of the most fascinating things about it is the history. Um, there's 12,000 years of continuous human habitation from the you know, the, the first Indians that moved into the area after the Ice Age up until, you know, you and I in the in the river in the park today. Um, and all of that history is represented. It's like a it's like an open book. You just have to pick a different chapter and read it. You can see signs of history and culture and heritage just about everywhere you look if you know what to look for. Um, and I think that that's fascinating. And I think that I'll lead part of into the next question that was on the list, which is what is my job and what do I do? Um, part of it and my favorite part about it is bringing those things to light for people. Um, not everybody can see the, you know, the history in the stone rows or the old foundations or um, some of those things. And so being able to explain that to people and show it to people and help them to understand that um, Delaware Water Gap represents more than just this moment in time. It represents a lot of people, a lot of time, a lot of changes. And um, that's, that's probably one of my, my favorite parts about it. But um, okay. getting out on the river is key. Have so you been? Uh, so I actually live, depending on what, um, I forget what specific part I'm at, I'm like four minutes away from one part of the river. Oh, nice. So for me, I live up in. Okay. So like when you check Google Maps, it just shows I'm right along. This. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So My I'm... office when I'm not teleworking is normally. In... Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. Well, I tried to visit the, the recreation center. Oh, by where I am, but it's obviously closed due to COVID. Yes. But, um, yeah, I know it's very close to where I live because I know um, going to 209 straight to Milford, it's just yep. right along that. Yeah, you get to see it all the time. That's a great trip too. Yeah. And you get a lot of nice views. And there's a couple spots in there where you can pull off and just spend five minutes. I know, I know from like, I one day I know I will stop one day and just watch but I know just with the glances I feel like I've seen it so many times mm -hmm. it's also so many of it I still haven't seen right yeah yeah um I think the the other well I'll let you go ahead and you're the interviewer so go ahead I was just kind of jumping ahead on the list of questions you gave me well I wanted to ask you a question that wasn't on it I believe mm -hmm. but it's what ma what made you so drawn to it when you were younger um it's where I grew up. And so I grew up in Warren County, um, which is just on the New Jersey side of the river. And it was important to my family. It was important to my parents. And, um, you know, we weren't, we weren't a rich family. Um, we didn't have a lot of extra money. And so our vacations were days spent out in the park, um, packing up the family car with lunch and fishing poles and heading out to go swim and skip rocks and fish and camp um, along the river. And so that's, that's, it was an important part of um, the way I grew up. And um, I think it's where I got my original connections to nature and um, being interested in it and understanding it. My parents exposed me to it at a really early age. And luckily like you, this was in my backyard. Mm -hmm. um, and so growing up, it was always a special place, even through, you know, high school. Um, my husband and I had our first blind date um, in the park along the river in a, you know, area close to the river. So um, it's just always been a constant. It's like, a, um, we like to say it's the main artery of the park, right? It's the, it's the source. It, it's the thing that um, makes it thrive. And so um, I feel that way a lot about the river. 
Okay. Um, and so having had the opportunity to be able to um, realize, first of all, just even realize that there was an opportunity, that there were actually careers and jobs and things that I could do um, in that place was like once I had that realization, it was fantastic. And so um, being able to go work for the Park Service allowed me to um, be at home. And so rather than, um, you know, it's like welcoming people. I get to welcome people to my home. I get to be a, um, I don't know, a, a hostess in some ways um, and share those things. And what's your favorite part about the job? Um, I think, again, it's that, it's that um, being able to open things up, um, flip the light switch on and have somebody be like, oh, wow, I never saw it that way before, or I didn't know, or, you know, I've been coming to this waterfall for, you know, years and years and years, but I never knew the history of the people who lived here before, or um, I never knew about the plants that are clinging to the side of the rocks there that are so unique. So um, being able to show things to people that they might have never seen before or didn't understand before, um, is really exciting and it gets it, you get to make their day sometimes the next question is what can you tell me about the water gap recreation area um so this year i'll give you a real exciting one this year we are um, as for 2021 we were the top um, we were the number 10 most visited national park unit out of all of the national parks in the country. So more visitors than Yellowstone and Grand Canyon, Acadia, um, all of those big parks that everybody thinks of when they hear of national parks. Um, and so um, being number 10 in visitation was pretty special. Um, and we felt it. Um, we definitely felt it as well. It was pretty crowded and pretty busy and there was a lot of trash and other things related to that. But um, where we're located and it has to do it we'll get into this a little bit when we talk more about tox island but we're located within a four to six hour drive of 60 million people who live between boston and washington so it's the most densely populated corridor in the entire united states and if you draw little rings around where the park is and you know drive times um 60 million people can get here on less than a tank of gas and so we are that kind of park in the middle of all of that population center. Um, and so we're easy to get to. We're a quick drive away. You can come and spend a couple days. You can come and spend a couple hours. We're also very close to, of course, you know, in, in the Pocono Mountain region. And so um, tourists and visitors who are coming to visit the Pocono Mountains are often coming to visit the park, but they didn't realize that they were coming to visit a national park, they were going to the Poconos. But part of their visit included something in the park, whether it was a trip on the river or a hike to one of the waterfalls or a stay at one of the campgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, we also, um, park is, a lot of people don't realize it is 40 miles long. You realize it because you drive that stretch on 209 up to Milford, it's a long stretch, um, 70,000 acres. It's in both states, New Jersey and Pennsylvania five different counties and 23, I think it is, different townships that make up the park. Um, we have uh, a little bit of everything. Again, I mentioned some of the cultural resources. We have um, a wide variety of natural resources, so wildlife, um, plant communities, things like that, including many um, that are either rare, threatened, or on the endangered species list, either federally or at the state level. And so um, by having this park that's protected, those species have a place where they too can be protected. And that's pretty exciting stuff too. Um, have you seen a bald eagle? Uh, I have a few it's times. Amazing, but when I was a kid, we never saw them. Um, and so when I talk to you know to school groups and things now, and I ask that question, how many of you have seen a bald eagle? When I talk to local kids, and all their hands go up, that's that's really exciting. And that's because the water quality is so clean, because the area can support that thriving habitat. Um, and so that that in itself symbolizes so much. I know at the, what's it, the Foxmore Flea Market, I've definitely seen a few hanging around there. Oh, really? I think because that lake is right just across from the flea market. There's like behind those apartments. Oh, yeah. There's a big lake back there. 
and I suspect that might be some fishing ground for them. You can hardly see it from 209, but when the leaves are off the trees, it's always like, wow, there's a huge lake. And even the one right next to the big A is also um, that mini pond. Yeah, that, that's the pond I'm thinking of. There's one on at the big A and then there's one across the street. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. What can you tell me about the Tox Island Dam project? I can tell you a lot about it. How much time do you have? No, seriously, how much time do you have? Uh, so I technically have until about 1.30. Oh, okay. Because that's when I have to start getting ready for work. <laughs> okay, um, it's not that long, um, definitely but it could be if you wanted it to be. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot out there. Um, so what I have is a, um, I have a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation that I've done for other groups that I pulled up this morning to kind of look at and see if, if that might be helpful. Um, so if it's okay with you, I'd like to kind of share my screen and throw that up there because it's also got some images in it that might be helpful. Yes. I can also give you those images so afterwards i can email you they're all park service property so they're um, public domain anybody can use them um, so i can send you some of the historic pictures um, okay. we've got some pictures of some of the protests that were happening um, uh, some of the original dam plans and things like that that might in, enrich your your presentation some so um, and i also have some other folks that i can connect you with so okay. we can circle back to all of that so let's uh there we go. I'm going to give my screen a share for a minute. Bear with me just a little bit. I'm glad it's just one person um, because I haven't done this in a little while. And I, when I went through it this morning, I'm like, wait, I think some of my slides are out of order. So I might jump around a little bit, but hang on. Okay. Let me down. All right. Just a little background on the park while I pull up some of my notes. All right. <laughs> oh, look at you. All right. So can I also... One second. Okay, I thought I could take my screen off, but okay. All right. So the park was established, and I hope I don't sound like I'm reading this, but some of it I actually am going to be reading for you. But um, the park really. was established in 1965 um, as part of a proposal to build a dam on the river at Tox Island. That is about six miles north of the Delaware Water Gap, so where the bridge crosses at I-80. If you were to go to Smithfield Beach off of River Road and stand at the canoe launch and look downstream, about maybe 100 yards downstream, you'll see the northern tip of Tox Island. So um, if you're looking for photos and things like that to include or video, that might be a good spot because you get some, some good river shots there with Tox Island. Um, center in the in the photo for you. Um, so I'm not sure how much of the local history of the region you know, but in 1955, the Upper Delaware Valley was struck with the worst natural disaster ever recorded in the region. People are still talking about it as the famous flood of 55. Um, the 55 flood is often cited as the reason for building a dam on, or the, the reason behind the idea to put a dam on the Delaware River. Um, but it's not actually the case. It was a really important turning point in the river's history, but it wasn't actually the reason or the start of the idea to put a dam on the river at Tox. Um, four states border the Delaware River, so New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. And so each of those states throughout history has looked at the river as their own. Um, it belongs to them, it's part of their state. However, each time um, one of those entities would impact the river, obviously it had an impact um, on the other states. And so my notes are fading out on me. Um, and so in 1783, you know, way back, the first treaty was signed regarding the Delaware River. It was signed between New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and it was an anti-dam treaty saying that neither one of those um, uh, colonies, states, um, would put a dam on the Delaware River because it would impact the other. And so they realized that they were sharing this resource. 
Um, this is the same year, 1783. I was a history major twice. So um, 1783 is the same year that the Revolutionary War ended, the Treaty of Paris was signed. Um, and this treaty between two states was actually signed and agreed to under the Articles of Confederation. So our earliest form of American government preceding the Constitution. Um, as we go a little bit further along in time and get into the 19th century and we start to see the rise of the Industrial Revolution, cities are starting to grow um, and grow rapidly. Um, New York City and Philadelphia, two very important cities on, on kind of either end um, outside of the park, um, they really grew rapidly and increased demands on the Delaware River um, for a source of household and industrial water supply. Um, were they were just it was just increasing as more people came more water was needed to drive mills and to power industry and to supply water to more and more homes um, so during this period there were lots and lots of studies and proposals and different negotiations going on back and forth between all of the states on the best way to be able to provide all of those things for all of the states and all of their residents obviously that was a little bit of a challenge and that continued all the way on until the 20th century. In 1931, um, this made it all the way to the US Supreme Court. And um, in this uh, court case, Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of our more famous justices, um, ruled that each state has a right to a fair share of the water. And so one state could not do something that would impact the other state's right to that fair share of the water. And so as a result, a few years later, the, um, the United States Corps of Engineers actually put out their first comprehensive water resources plan for the Delaware River. And in it was included a dam at Tox Island. That's the first time that we saw that particular dam being proposed. Of course, that led to the need for more studies, more surveys. They even collected some core samples of the, um, the bedrock in the area to see how um, to see how sturdy things were and to see what um, what the bedrock and what the soil types were, see if it could even support a dam. So moving along through time and history as all of this is happening and studies and negotiations and talks are going on, World War II. We hit that World War II era and the landscape here um, worldwide really changed for a couple of years. World War II delayed plans that were already kind of moving forward and it kind of put a hold on those studies and on those discussions and negotiations. Yeah, negotiations. Yeah, you got it, that word. Um, but after the war, there was a boom, right? That post-war boom, economic boom, where people were um, fairly well off and negotiations started to resume again among the states about um, this possibility of putting a dam on the Delaware River. And that brings us to the summer of 1955. Let me see, there we go. Summer of 1955, um, by that time, it really appeared that there was a clear track being readied for a construction of the dam. This is prior to the flood. Um, it really sounded like things were moving along and there was a full head of steam to put a dam on the Delaware River at Tux Island or elsewhere. Um, 1955 was a scorcher. It was one of the hottest and driest years on record in our area. Um, oops, sorry. Um, on August 12th, in the midst of that drought, streams were empty, crops were drying up, farmers were in big trouble, um, remembering that it, a lot of this area was an agricultural area at that time. Um, and people's, people really relied on the land and on agriculture. So on August 12th, the drought ended really fast. Um, Hurricane Connie dumped anywhere between four and 12 inches of rain in the Delaware River Basin, depending on where you were. There was some minor localized flooding as you know, streams and creeks rose really fast and overflowed their banks and then subsided again. The dry soil was moistened and the plants started to turn green. Um, stream levels were refilled, reservoir levels recovered and refilled. Soils were saturated and plants were able to grow again um, and the drought was over and people celebrated. And then a week later, um, Connie's, uh, as she's been called sometimes her evil twin sister, 
um, Diane came up the East Coast a week later. Um, this is in a time where we don't have the benefit of, um, you know, satellite uh, weather right on our, in the palm of our hand on our cell phones. Um, these things weren't available tools. Um, and so weather forecasting was not anywhere near as precise as it is today. People knew that a storm was coming, um, but it was supposed to take a westerly course and avoid our area. However, uh, Diane took a turn and she headed directly east and took a course up the Delaware Valley that paralleled the river. So the river is between two ridges and it forms this wonderful channel where the storm was able to just kind of get in there and just follow the river all the way up through the Delaware Valley. Diane dropped another 11 inches of rain on an area that was already soaked. Think of a soaking wet sponge and then trying to pour more water onto that soaking wet sponge. You've got to give it some time, squeeze it out, let it drain before you can add more water. And so when Diane hit, water just flowed off. The streams were already full, the reservoirs were already full, the ground was already soaked. And so we saw major flooding. Most of it was on the tributaries, not on the Delaware River. It was over $100 million in property damage throughout the area. If you travel on the, um, the bridge between East Stroudsburg and Stroudsburg, that really important connector, that bridge was washed out, as were many bridges across the county and throughout the area. Um, there were 100 deaths as a result of the flooding. Um, most of those, um, in fact, all of those were along tributaries. Um, and not along the main stem, but flooding was very severe. Um, there was a small camp, um, a religious camp, um, just, uh, just outside of East Stroudsburg at a location called Anilomink on the Broadhead. And most of the fatalities um, happened at that camp when a wall of water came roaring down the Broadhead Creek. Um, people did not have enough time, enough warning to be able to evacuate and to be able to get out of the way. And many of the cabins um, and other structures in that camp were washed away, um, causing a, a very tragic loss of, loss of life. Um, in the wake of the flood, the desire to put a dam on the river became even greater, for, greater than ever. And now it wasn't just about water supply, which was really what people were talking about earlier, now it was also about flood control. And when you talk about flood control, you start to open the door um, to massive federal involvement and you start to, you have to bring in the Army Corps of Engineers. So this is a view of Tops Island, uh, an aerial view taken in 1962. Um, the fields on this side are the Pennsylvania side. Um, this is the New Jersey side, and you can see this line here where Old Mine Road travels along the New Jersey side of the river. Um, our Smithfield Beach would be located right up in here um, at the northern, just up upstream from the northern end of Tox Island. This is an artist rendering, and again, I'll send you all of these images if you'd like them so that you can use them however you, um, however works best for you. Um, this is an artist rendering of what that dam would have looked like. This would have been on the New Jersey side carved in. Um, the, the 160 foot tall dam um, across the river and water depths on the upstream side just behind the dam would have been about 165 feet. Uh, 100, I'm sorry, 160 feet deep, and it would have created a 37 mile long reservoir behind the dam. So rather than the free flowing river that exists today, it would have been a massive lake similar to um, the lakes we see out west, um, like behind the Hoover Dam and uh, the Grand Coulee Dam, places like that. Um, so 1960, um, just see, okay, so 1960, we start to see um, some new players that also start to get interested in this whole idea of damming the river. Um, so think back a little bit about some of the history. Um, who do you think might have been interested in a dam project that held water behind a reservoir? What, what, is, another, what is another potential use for that water? Any ideas? Housing? Uh, no. So, um, 
we started to see the power companies get interested. The idea of harnessing the power of the water um, in a reservoir and being able to pump it up on top onto the top of the ridge and then let it fall um, with gravity down the other side of the ridge would have generated hydroelectric power. And so now we're looking at this dam that would provide water supply, flood control, and also hydroelectric power. So wow, what a great thing, right? It's got all of these benefits. Um, and so lots of people are interested in it. Um, in 1961, the estimated cost for the project were going to be about $90 million. They thought that would cover absolutely everything. Um, by 1967, it had gone up to $198 million. By 1969, $214 million, and um, nothing had actually begun on the actual dam yet at that time. Um, and so that's really important to kind of remember. It was 1962 when the project was actually authorized by Congress. Um, so the Tux Island Dam project gets authorized by Congress 1962. It gets some funding in 1964. Uh, let's see. And during this time, we start to see the opposition starting to heat up. Um, the National Recreation Area, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing, so I just want to make sure I'm clear. So the Army Corps of Engineers is going to build this dam and a reservoir, 37 miles long. It would provide water supply, um, flood control, and hydroelectric power. It um, would be managed by the Army Corps of Engineers. The land around the lake or the reservoir was intended to be managed by the National Park Service. So it would have been a ribbon of land around this reservoir that would have been a national park called Tox Island Lake National Recreation Area surrounding the reservoir and providing recreational opportunities based on that water and based on that reservoir. So things like boat slips and marinas and docks and campgrounds and hiking areas, um, all of that type of thing would have been, was planned for the area around the river. And so that actually became the fourth justification for why um, people um, who wanted to build the dam. Not only would it provide flood control, as I keep saying, right, flood control, um, uh, uh, water supply, and um, I lost my train of thought. What's the third one? Yeah. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but it would have also provided recreational opportunities. And the Army Corps believed that by providing recreational opportunities, the whole idea of the dam would become possibly a little bit more palatable to people. They would see it as a place that was something for them, something that they could use, something that they could get benefit from. And yet still, there was some great opposition. And again, all this time, the, the, the Army Corps of Engineers is still looking, studying, taking core samples out of the ground. They're still working on these plans. And as I shared before, the costs are starting to go up. Um, we saw a lot of opposition um, starting out locally, small grassroots groups that were opposed to originally the idea of damming the river um, in order to um, make way for the dam. See if I have that one, sorry. In order to make way for the dam, um, land had to be acquired and um, that land was actually owned by people. It was owned by families. I mentioned earlier that the River Valley has evidence of 12,000 years of continuous human habitation. Um, the first European settlers in the area came around 1700 and so there were farms um, homesteads in the park, uh, in what became the park, that had been in the same family for generations and generations and generations. In some cases, those properties were purchased directly from the King of England before we even became the United States of America and were still individual colonies. And so you have to understand that this is um, these farm sites, these homesteads, this land, this place was integral to these people, to this culture, to their heritage. And so that was also being threatened as properties began to be purchased. 
um, and land began to be acquired even before the final plans were made for the dam. And so that was very frustrating for people. Small local grassroots, uh, grassroots groups organized in opposition. Um, one was the Delaware Valley Conservation Association. And some of those members are um, still around today. One is a very good friend of mine. Um, and I'll, I'll get you some contact information for her as well. Um, another was the Lenny, Lenny Lenape League. And so these small groups eventually got together and became bigger groups. And those groups eventually reached out to larger groups like the Sierra Club and other well-known organizations that were interested in this project and in the damages to the resources, the damages to the cultural heritage um, and the things that were happening to these families um, who owned property in the Valley. This really, really started to pick up stream in 1966 um, with the fight to save Sunfish Pond. Sunfish Pond is probably one of the most popular destinations in the park. Um, it's along the Appalachian Trail. It's about a four mile hike each way. And it is this beautiful glacial lake, a 40 acre glacial lake up on top of the ridge. When I talked earlier about the hydroelectric power, the plan was to pump water out of the reservoir, up the side of the ridge, store it, in Sunfish Pond, which they wanted to enlarge to make a reservoir out of, and then down the other side. And so that, that glacial lake was really, really important to people. Um, and they didn't want to see that happen. And so we started to see things that um, began with simply with a letter writing campaign. Um, had they had social media back in that day, things would have been very, very very, very different, I think. Um, but it started with a letter writing campaign, started with letters to the editor, it started with articles being written for local magazines. Um, and again, bringing in all of those conservation organizations into this single voice in opposition to building a dam on the Delaware River. And by 1967, that got the attention of Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. Um, he was a staunch conservationist and he had heard about this issue. Um, he decided that he would hike and lead a hike to Sunfish Pond with a couple hundred of his closest hiking buddies. Um, and that brought national attention for the first time to this cause, to this issue. The next year, over 2,000 people made that same pilgrimage to Sunfish Pond to continue to bring attention to this issue. 1969, Sunfish Pond was returned. Um, it had been bought from the state of New Jersey by the power companies. It was returned to the state of New Jersey. And today it is part of Worthington State Forest, one of the most popular state parks in New Jersey. It is a national natural landmark and it is declared one of the seven wonders of New Jersey. Um, it was that fight to save Sunfish Pond, though, that really, really brought all of those opposition groups together and helped to gain that public, um, public attention and sympathy. And not only for um, what was happening with the dam, but what very specifically with what was happening to the people who were going to be losing their property and making some ultimate sacrifices. One of the other things that's really important about this and some of the timing is that um, these conservation groups and even the local residents were really, really frustrated about some of the environmental impacts of damming a free flowing river, including increased pollution, um, mud flats around the side of the reservoir when the water was drawn down in times of need, it would have created large, um, and I understand smelly, mud flats along the side of the water. Um, there would have been changes in the water quality, um, effects on downstream areas, including um, uh, the estuary. So again, the river goes all the way down to Delaware. If we had put this dam on the river at Tox Island, it would have had an impact on um, how far the salt water comes up the Delaware River from the bay, and it would have had a drastic effect on some of the fisheries in that area, and it would have also created a lot of wildlife, uh, loss of wildlife habitat. In, um, I have to check the year, but I think it was 1968, um, the National Environmental Policy Act was passed. It was signed by President Nixon. And this um, project, the Tox Island Dam project, 
was one of the first projects to have to go through that analysis process where all of those environmental impacts were going to be looked at really closely. Um, the, um, the first draft of that um, environmental impact statement did not look very favorable for the dam. It identified all of these environmental issues that I, that I just talked about. Um, and additionally, it identified other problems like loss of cultural history and loss of archeological sites. Um, and so environmental concerns really brought out that preservationist sentiment and more and more interest um, in the idea of preserving this entire area as a national park um, and as some sort of uh, a way to protect it. And that brought in, um, uh, it started, we started to see some more support from those groups on the idea of a national park that might not just be around the border of the reservoir, it might be something even bigger, bigger than that. Um, of course, again, you know, the, the local residents were a big factor in all this. Um, during the years that the dam was being studied and contested, it literally was a war zone here. Um, there were fights, there were battles, there were protests, there were bulldozers um, coming in to bulldoze properties to get people out of them. There were a lot of hard feelings, there were suicides. Um, there um, were arsons, people decided that they would rather burn their property down than have the um, US government take it out from under them. And so, um, as you can imagine, this is a pretty tense area um, and that land acquisition process really, really added to that. Um, in 1967, the idea was originally to start at the very south end, um, beginning in 67 and purchase land and start moving northward um, where possible. Um, when owners were willing to sell their land, um, an offer of what was called fair market value was, was offered. Um, if they chose to fight that or um, chose uh, to hold out, um, eventually those properties could be, and in some cases were condemned um, and taken. Um, and all of this was happening under a process um, in the constitution called eminent domain that I encourage you to look a little bit more into because it is still something that's it's out there it still happens today when people you know when a when a township wants to put a highway in or expand a road and they need to take a piece of somebody's front yard um, so in um, 1969 we start to see a lot of vacant properties in the park um, people had moved out the army corps had acquired the properties um, some people were allowed to stay for a little while, um, at least until maybe the waters got to that area, but others left um, and moved to, moved to other places. Um, but now you have an Army Corps who's left with all of these vacant houses, and they decided in 1969 that maybe a way that they could make some money would be to rent these houses. Um, and so they put some ads in some New York papers like the Village Voice and some other papers um, for inexpensive rent and invited people to come and live in these houses that we had just evicted all of these long-term homeowners from. And so again, as you can imagine, um, that brought about a lot of hard feelings. Um, eventually, um, this whole idea did not work out so well. Um, the squatters, weren't real good about paying rent. Um, they weren't real good about um, caring for the properties. Um, this was again the, the 1960s. And so um, a lot of people were here. There were communes. Um, people were looking for a place to live off the land. And they found that when the Army Corps offered up these, um, these buildings. Um, but eventually that got so out of hand that the federal government um, brought in federal marshals to start evicting the squatters that they had invited and in doing so bulldozing some of the homes that those squatters were living in to guarantee that they would not return. This brought a lot of adverse publicity for the project and it brought a lot of very hard feelings from local residents. You can ask me questions or interrupt anytime. I'm on a roll. Um, I'm just so, listening. I'm just okay. listening and just taking it all in because I'm okay. about. I can wait. also shoot you this PowerPoint too. Um, so there's my river. 
um, beautiful, wild and scenic, free flowing. Um, eventually the Tux Island Dam project was deauthorized. In 1975, the Delaware River Bas Basin Commission met, that's an organization of um, representatives of each of the five states, and they voted three to one against the Tux Island Dam. Pennsylvania, just in case you wanted to know, voted for it. Um, in 75 through 77, there were lots of efforts to deauthorize the dam in Congress and they just didn't seem to be going anywhere. So this was a project that was still on the books, but kind of just stuck in this awkward limbo. But in 1978, the Delaware River was included as a scenic and recreational river under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And so in, in 1978, the Delaware River was named the Middle Delaware Scenic and Recreational River. It is now its own National Park Service unit within Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area and has a very high level of protection. When the Delaware River was included in the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act and received that high level of protection, that precluded any further development along the river. And in effect, it precluded the possibility that a dam, any dam, not just the Tox Island Dam, could be built on the Delaware River. Um, and so eventually that led to deauthorization in Congress, but not until 1992. And so today it remains undammed, wild and scenic, free flowing, um, host to lots and lots, thousands and thousands and thousands of people who come each year to fish, to swim, to paddle, um, or just sit by the shore and listen and watch as it goes by. It is the pulse of the park. It is the 33rd largest river in the country, and it is the last undammed river east of the Mississippi. And that is something that we are very proud of. That is something that, um, we owe a great debt to those who sacrificed, um, to those who fought against the dam and who enabled the river to exist as it does today. And so um, that, that's, that's my presentation in a nutshell. Um, I wanna throw out there too that 10% um, of the American population currently get their water supply from the Delaware River. And so keeping it clean is as more or more important than it ever has been. Um, today, the issue of the dam still comes up um, when we have a series of floods. Um, where did they go? Let's see. There we go. That was 2004, 2005, and 2006, not all that long ago. There were three 100 year floods in 22 months. After this, we started to hear a lot of people speaking back up. I saw letters to the editor in local newspapers. Um, we heard people saying, hey, couldn't we have prevented this from happening if we put that dam on the Delaware River like we talked about in the 1960s? And so while it is deauthorized by Congress, it is still an idea that comes up in some people's minds when we see issues with flooding along the river. So let me unshare this. Stop share. Sorry for not like asking questions. For me, I love history, so I love to like fully take in everything. Okay, good. And like learning about the history was very fascinating because I did not know most about that. Oh, okay. Good. I'm glad I could see that makes my day, right? That's what I like best about my job. Getting to show people things they, they might not have known or may have known a little bit about, but didn't quite get the, the full picture. And I apologize, like that is still scratching the surface summary. Oh, no, don't worry. Yeah. Like for me, I find it very interesting just because one, it's local history. Yeah. And it's just stuff I don't know about. Just because, yeah. like, there's the thunderstorm happening right now. That's what I thought. I, I hear a lot of wind behind me picking up. Yeah. I just heard. Yeah, I just heard thunder, hit and then my dogs went crazy. Oh. If we so, get cut off, we can reconnect another time. But yeah, just in case. I just also, I had a few questions also come in from one of my other, one of the other people that came in, that's also in my group. Yeah. And they also said one of the questions they had was, 
what made you decide to choose this career path, choose this as a career path? Hmm. Um, it kind of came, it came by accident. It came naturally, I guess. Um, my love of history and sharing it with people and talking about it. Um, again, growing up, um, being out in the park all the time. Um, that's something that I continued as a, you know, you know, to my teen years, as a young adult, as an adult. Um, and so um, I've been with the park at Delaware Water Gap for, uh, this is my 24th year. Um, so about 25 years ago, um, was out on a hike in the park on a weekend with, you know, my husband and two friends doing what we usually do. And I was doing what I usually do. Hey, did you know that tree used to be used by the Indians for such and such? And hey, did you know that that foundation over there um, shows us the history of this family that used to live here? And that means that, and like, just, yeah, um, that was what I did. It's still what I do when I go out with people. Um, just, there's so much out there that I want to be able to share. And a friend said to me um, on that hike, wow, you should work here. And I was like, huh, maybe I should, like, I don't even know. Like when I first um, went back to ESU um, as an adult, I was majoring, I wanted to major in history, but I didn't know what else you could do with history other than be a teacher. I, I really didn't. And so I was majoring in secondary ed with a, a social studies concentration. Um, but I figured out pretty quickly that that wasn't really what I wanted to be doing. I wanted to be doing more on the history side of it. And I just didn't know what was available. Um, and, and I honestly didn't get a lot of assistance from my advisor in that. Um, I'm not sure that they knew what all was available either. And so when my friend Shana said, you should work here, that just kind of clicked on a light bulb. And so on Monday, the following Monday, I started looking things up, making some phone calls. Um, I called the parks um, personnel office and asked like, where, where would one even begin? Um, and within a few months, um, I was able to apply for a seasonal park ranger position, um, which I got, um, I was very excited by that. And I worked as a seasonal for um, three years and then worked my way through a student hiring program. Um, and we had some, um, programs at that time for outstanding scholars. And so by keeping my grades up and staying a student, um, I was able to use that to transition into a permanent position. Um, and so it was, I don't know that it was a choice as much as a light that went on and an opportunity realized. Here, I was able to find a way to express my love of history, um, my background in history, but also um, my deep-rooted passion and understanding of um, the natural world and find a place where they could overlap. Um, you can't really talk about the history of our area without talking about the, the natural resources and what brought people here and what was here that allowed them to be able to settle in this area. And you also can't really talk about the forest and the trees and the plants and the wildlife without talking about the human impacts on it. And so Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area to me is like that tapestry where both of those things are woven together. You can't really pull one of those threads apart and say, well, let's just look at this because they're just so woven together that they create that real picture of what the park is and what this area is all about. So um, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but it okay. was, um, I don't know that it was ever where I said I want to grow up and work for the Park Service, um, but I sure was happy once I kind of figured out that, that that was my place. Okay. It didn't take long to figure out this is my place. That's also great. I have two more questions that I'm going to ask. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, they wanted to, is it safe to swim at the water gap? And what precautions should an individual take? if swimming is allowed? Oh, make me so happy. Make me very happy to answer that question. Um, public safety has been one of the things that I've been most involved with in my time at the park, um, especially as it, result, as it relates to water safety. 
Um, we have an average of two drownings a year in the park. Um, last year, we had our second highest, um, second highest year with drownings ever with five in about a six week period. Um, part of my job is to um, write the press releases, write the safety messages that go when, when something like this happens, um, sometimes to coordinate some of the, um, uh, if there's a family involved and they, they, um, they want something said about their family member that's been lost, I can work with them to, you know, to talk a little bit about their family member. Um, and I, I also maintain a database of all of our drowning incidents that go back in, um, to 1971. And there are, I think it's 114 or some um, on my database. And so I track that and I look at it all the time to identify different trends, what age group, um, what demographic, what activity. And so what I will tell you and your friends is that the average drowning victim in the park is a 27 year old male um, from the greater New York City metropolitan area. Um, it's most likely to be on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon after 3 p.m., probably in the month of July or August. And that's based on 50 years of incident data. And so um, that is something that is, um, I've been there. I've been the first person that been on scene. I've been the person who was at the visitor center when somebody ran in and said, somebody's drowning. Um, I've been there to support other team members as, as we've gone through it and to help support family members. And so it is something that is extremely important to me. I want people to be able to come back and enjoy another day in the park, um, including the friends and family members that come and sometimes witness these tragic events. And so I will tell all of you that no one has ever drowned in the park while wearing a properly fitted and fastened life jacket. It just has never happened. It is the number one thing that you can do. Um, most of our drowning incidents happen when people are swimming. So in some cases, they might have started out on a boat trip or a kayaking trip or a canoe trip, and then they pull over to the side, decide to go for a swim, take off the life jacket, jump in, and don't come back out. And so wearing a life jacket is the number one thing. There are some really nice ones out there. They're not all those big orange, like, you know, Titanic things. Um, you can be cool in a life jacket. Um, you can really set a good, um, a good example, be a good role model for others by wearing a life jacket. Um, it will save me the time of having to write your name in a press release. That's a very sad question, but... Um, it's really important to me. It's very fascinating too, because like when you said the demographics of it's a 27 year old male from New, typically from New York, that was a loud one. Typically- That was a loud one. <laughs> typically, for me at least, I would, have, I would have assumed that it was probably someone between 10, like between five and 15 around that age. Right. Right. But the one thing when you said New York, it really does like when I picture it, I imagine it as just so, like a few people just trying to get drunk over a weekend and just not just trying to have a good time. Typically, since they're in the city, they really don't know how to swim. Right. So when they go out, and that's what's most tragic. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the hard part. I mean, we've talked to, you know, friends and family and, and, they were having the best day. They were out there on the water with a bunch of buddies and just having the best day. And then it ends tragically. And so a lot of it is that people either don't know how to swim or overestimate their swimming abilities. Almost anybody that we ask, are you a good swimmer? They're like, yeah, I'm a good swimmer. They're not all good swimmers. Um, and so also swimming in the river is very different. People don't always realize that jumping in the river, I mean, you drive by it, you see it, there are some areas that look like a lake. It doesn't look like it's moving. 
um, it looks very, very still. And so jumping into the river where there is a swift current underneath the surface that you can't see, um, where it's not like when you go into a lake and you gradually get deeper and deeper. You can be walking in the river and then suddenly step off into a deep hole and get caught up in that current. And so I think unfamiliarity with the river conditions um, and with that flowing water. Um, I also believe that a lot of folks from farther east also spend time swimming in the ocean. The ocean is a very different thing because the salt water actually gives you more buoyancy. And so when you get into the river, if you're expecting that same kind of, oh, but I float, you won't float the same way when you get into the river. So um, wearing life jackets is definitely the number one thing. I think um, I, off the top of my head, and it's unfortunate, but I am in this data almost every day. Um, I think we have only had three or four drownings out of over a hundred that have been under 18. So kids. Yeah, because I, I want to say I remember one that happened a few years ago. I think I had to be sixth or seventh grade, and just hearing about a little, like a little kid drowning, and he was like fishing with his dad, and the current just pulled him away. That's, and, that was at Bushkill Access. He was nine. Cool. Um, it was absolutely tragic. They were dad and son fishing. Um, it was absolutely tragic and we almost lost the father too, um, trying to save his son. Yeah. So they stick with you. Um, yeah. It was also like- So wear your life jacket. Be cool, wear your life jacket. And like for me, I'm, so I'm a lifeguard as well, like at, in Pocono Ranch Lands. Oh, so, you know we're well, hiring lifeguards right now. We pay more. Just saying. <laughs> I, I know. For me, it's okay. only two minutes away from my house. But for me, yeah, I know like if like someone asked me, like, oh, are you a good swimmer? I'd say I'm a decent swimmer. But if you asked me to like swim eight laps, I know right. I'd have to stop like on the second or third one just to take a few deep breaths and then just keep going. But I know right. like if I stayed in a river with a strong current, I don't think I'd be able to even save myself. Right, because swimming in a pool, you don't have that constant current buffeting you one way or the other. And so it's a, it's a lot more um, strenuous to be able to swim in the river unless you're you know, swimming downstream with the current, um, which is a really important piece of safety advice. If you should find yourself in trouble in the river and you're not wearing a life jacket, um, the best thing to do is to get your feet downstream so that your head doesn't bounce off of rocks so as you go. Um, you can push off of things with your feet, but get your head upstream, your feet downstream, and try to float or swim with the current and then over to the shore. So rather than trying to swim straight across back to the spot where you were, which is what a lot of people try to do, then you're just fighting the current and it's really, really strenuous. But if you just kind of go with the current across and downstream, and then take a little walk back up, um, you'll be able to safely exit the river just farther down from where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Then your risk is poison ivy instead of, yeah. you know, yep. Okay, and so the what last yeah. the last question I have for you today is how has COVID affected the water gap? Oh, you're not gonna ask me if anybody's ever given me the finger? <laughs> Or how many people get pissed off at the Delaware Water Gap, if that helps? A lot of people get pissed off at us. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that was one of the questions. I guess somebody else had mentioned that one of my colleagues that they um, sometimes look, oh, residents uh, or former residents might give them the finger. Oh, yeah, um, I just look. We it's spoke been to another. Real. Yeah, it says, we spoke to another faculty member who said that some families will give park employees the finger. Do you have any experiences like that? Um, it's been a while, um, but I have had people, you know, come up at the visitor center and, you know, come in to ask a question and kind of do the like, you know, without touching me, but like poking at you and saying, you, you took my family's land. 
And I'm like, dude, I was like six. Um, and so, but, but nowadays the, the thing, and I, th I didn't really get to this with the, um, when I talked about talks, um, we do start to see a lot of people kind of coming around a little bit these days. Yes, there's still a lot of anger. There's still a lot of bitterness. There's still a lot of hurt um, over what happened and people losing their property. But as you look around in the surrounding area and you see how things have changed and how much development has popped up all over the area, it would be foolish to think that this area would have been immune to that and would have been different. We were already starting to see, you know, farms shrinking, um, farm operations changing in order to keep up with the times. And so um, it is, um, we see people come back now that say, you know, I was very much against this at the time, um, but if it weren't for the fact that the park were here preserving this area now, I wouldn't be able to go back to my grandfather's farm or I wouldn't be able to go back to the hunting camp where I used to go when I was a kid or um, even if the Boy Scout camp doesn't exist anymore, the place where I used to go to Boy Scout camp, I can still visit that. And so we start to see a lot of that, um, that sentiment come back around. Um, not quite saying thanks y'all for protecting this for us, but um, definitely saying, you know, I, I understand a little bit more now and I see what's happened. And I don't think that this would be the same place that it was prior to the Tox Island Dam if this hadn't happened. Um, and so it's just kind of all part of that, that tapestry. Um, yeah. But, um, and I did also wanna to say too, I'll, I'll give you contact information, but um, one of my dearest friends in the world is um, Ruth Jones. She's, I think, 87 now. Um, Ruth Jones owned the property at the very, very southern end of the park. Um, if you cross the I-80 bridge into New Jersey, that first exit, the visitor center there, that was her family's property. They owned a bar and a restaurant. They had cabins. They had a swim beach. And that was the site of the first ever canoe business that took people upriver and then you know, they could come back down so they would drive you back and forth. She was one of the first people to have her property taken from her and she can um, very vividly tell the story about the day that the federal marshals came to her house with her eviction notice um, and how she um, she opened the door uh, with her daughter and her daughter was standing behind her and crying and um, she will tell the story of how she took that piece of paper and pushed it back at the marshal and told him exactly what he could do with and where he could put his eviction notice. Um, Ruth went on, um, she did eventually lose her property, but she went on to um, uh, continue her family business. Um, she found land further north, just outside the park. And she was able to work with the park service over the last 50 years as the owner of Kittatinny Canoes. Um, to provide canoe rentals to our visitors who are going out there on the river. And for the last 30 years, she has um, uh, supported and sponsored a volunteer three-day, every year, volunteer river cleanup. Um, Ruth's motto is that she has been making a living off the river for her entire life and that you cannot keep taking from the resources without giving something back to the resources. And so by providing that cleanup opportunity and opportunities for people to get out there and know and love the river, she's making that difference. Um, Ruth is a fascinating person to talk to. And so I'll, I'll give you contact information if that's somebody that you would wanna follow up with. But um, I do still am in touch with some of the original residents. Um, and if you look at our Facebook page, which I encourage you to do, um, you can see that um, there's still, you can still see some of the, um, the anger and sentiment come out. Uh, we just did a post last week about something, you know, like a place to go for a hike, um, something that seemed very innocuous. And one of the comments on it was that we should give the land back to the original owners. Um, of course, somebody else commented on that and said, who? The Native Americans? Um, and so 
you can see that that argument can get a couple layers deep, but that mm -hmm. sentiment is still very much alive and very much out there. And we see it all the time on our social media sites. So, sorry, I got off track because I don't worry. Has anybody ever given you the finger question was a good one. Um, we've been yelled at, called names. Um, yeah. I can that, imagine that. Because, like, I work yeah. at, um, so, like, I work at a supermarket, like, as of right now. So then I, like, there's a lot of people that over the slightest things will flip out. So I can't even imagine yes. how it is for you. And when people say, oh, you, you guys took my land. Yeah. Customer service, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, so your, your question about COVID? Yes. So how has it affected the Delaware um, Water Gas so, business? Mm -hmm. So um, one way is right here. This is not my office at work. This is my sunroom at home, which has been converted to an office for the past um, 58 weeks. I've started tracking things and it's like the apocalypse, right? I track it in terms of weeks. So um, this is my 58, 58th week primarily teleworking, which works for my job. Um, I do go into the park, I work on weekends when it's busy and I go in for different things, but um, I've been primarily teleworking, as have any, um, most of my coworkers who are able to. Those of us who have jobs that are primarily in offices are working from home. Um, we do a lot of these, um, a lot of team meetings. Some days I'm, I'm looking at the Brady Bunch on my screen all day long as we um, luckily have all these new tools that we're able to use to be able to meet and share information um, and you know collaborative, collaboratively work on things. Um, since March last year, um, mid-March, um, we started really changing our operations on March 13th. March 13th was the day that I packed up a bunch of files and folders and computers and hardware and whatever I thought I was going to need to go home and work for a little while. I never expected it to be 58 weeks. Um, I've since had to go back a bunch of times and get some other stuff and it's going to be a whole truckload when I have to move it all back someday. But um, since that time in March, mid-March last year, we started to see incredible spikes in visitation. Park doesn't usually get busy until you know, we get, we get a couple busy weekends in April when the weather first starts to get nice. Um, and then it's still kind of quiet while kids are still in school. Um, we usually don't really, really get busy until after Memorial Day. And it really kicks in after Father's Day towards the end of June, which is usually when all of the schools are out of session and everybody can come. Last year, we started to see those spikes starting in mid-March and we were like, whoa, Where's everybody coming from? Aren't we on stay at home orders? <laughs> like, wow, what's happening? And we started to see parking lots fill to capacity by like nine, 10 o'clock in the morning through March and April, um, which was definitely unusual. As we moved farther into the summer, that trend just continued to rise. And we just saw unprecedented visitation levels at areas um, throughout the park. Our most popular spots, like the trails to the top of either mountain that make up the gap or the waterfall areas or swim beaches. Those are always really popular and those remained popular and even more so. Um, but we were starting to see areas fill that people had hardly even ever heard of. Places where visitors almost never went. And we were starting to hear those places filling to capacity and overflowing parking areas every single weekend from mid-March all the way through until November. And even in November, we had some nice days and people were out hiking. Even through the winter where things really quiet down, this year was a lot busier than previous winters with more visitors out, more people coming out to take hikes um, and things like that. So um, by the time all was said and done, we increased our visitation last year by um, close to a million people, 800, I think it was 800,000 people more than the previous year. But we also know that we're missing a lot of those people. We are not always able to count people who come park and just head out and go for a hike because they didn't come through one of the checkpoints or one of the places where we have a, a 
traffic counter or a trail counter. So our visitation was likely much more than the 4.1 million people who are recorded, but that alone was enough to put us in the top 10. Um, I mentioned that visitor center area right off of Interstate 80 when you cross into New Jersey, that first exit, that is the trail access for the most popular trail in the park, which leads up to the top of Mount Mince, or Mount Tammany. Um, that, that amazing view that you get from the top of that mountain. Um, that area alone, we, we did visitation counts there. Um, if you look at all 423 national parks in the country and how many visitors they got last year, if that one site was a national park, it would have been number 123. So one site in our park got more visitors than 300 and some other national parks got in their entire year. Um, so it was that busy. We, um, we doubled the amount of times our, our trash collection dumpsters. So we have maintenance that go around, pick up the trash out of all the cans, that goes into a big dumpster, and then the dumpsters get taken away by one of our service providers. We filled and dumped our dumpsters twice as many times last year as we have in previous years. Um, and so there's you know, a number of different ways that we were able to look at how many visitors we got. Our fee areas took in almost twice as much money as they had taken in the previous year. Um, and so by every way that you can measure our visitation, it went through the roof. This is obviously extremely challenging when um, we can only accommodate so many people in some areas. Um, if you have 50 parking spaces and 200 people show up, that starts to get to be a problem. Um, we had issues where um, cars were parking along the interstate and like walking across the highway to get to hiking trails. Um, we had issues where so many cars parked in an area that emergency vehicles couldn't get through and they started to block each other in. Um, and so we've had to bring in as much staff as we possibly can um, during the summer when things are really busiest, we bring in staff and that's when I'll come in. We bring in staff that normally work in offices during the week and they switch out their schedules and come in to help out in the parking lots, um, directing traffic, those types of things on weekends because there are just so many people and we have to make sure that um, they're not blocking up traffic, they're not blocking up roads, that everybody is getting where they need to go safely, nobody's running anybody over. Um, and so it really becomes a traffic control challenge um, on busy weekends. Um, there are some regulations in place um, about distancing, you might have heard about some of those, um, and some recommendations. Um, those are sometimes followed and sometimes not followed. Um, we often come upon groups that are, you know, mixed family groups, um, not all from the same family, not all from the same household that are gathering together. Um, there's also a mandate now that all visitors um, on federal lands and in federal buildings <clears throat> must wear a mask at all times. Um, we're seeing, except, you know, if you're outdoors, you must wear a mask if you are within six feet of other people. So if you're hiking on a trail and there's nobody else around, you do not have to wear your mask. But if somebody else is coming down the trail and you're going to pass each other, you need to put your mask on. Um, and so we're, we're seeing COVID fatigue, just like everybody around the country is starting mm -hmm. to see. Um, we see some resistance to following those guidelines and regulations. We see them questioned. Um, and so the best thing that we can do as employees is just make sure that we're taking all of the precautions, that we're modeling safe behavior, that we're modeling the guidelines, and that we're doing all that we can to protect ourselves and to protect our visitors when we're out there. Um, it can be challenging sometimes when you're talking to a couple hundred people um, coming in from all over the place. Um, and you know we're talking to those people all day long. Um, and so it, it can be challenging. Um, Yes, wearing a mask all day long when you're talking to people can be challenging, um, but there's ways to do it and there's ways to get a break. Um, and so that's that's the best that we can do is, is be the best role models um, and practice practice those guidelines for ourselves so that we can keep each other, keep ourselves safe. 
Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know a lot of people as of now are just tired of COVID with the fatigue because especially yeah. working in a supermarket. Right. Just, yeah. Trying to get people to put, put a mask on that just refuse to. Yep, it's, it's just... the same thing, right? Um, and you get people get political about it. And, you know, we, we as a federal agency, we stay above and separate from that. Um, mm -hmm. that. People come at us with politics sometimes. And it's, you know, we have to disengage. Um, so it's, it's definitely been a challenge. Um, but the flip side of the coin is that last year we welcomed first time visitors who've never been to the park before. We welcomed so many people who got to come to the park to get away, to get out of the city, to get out of their houses when everything else around them was closed down and they had no place to go. You couldn't go to a restaurant, to a movie theater, to the, you know, uh, your favorite places to go. And so last year, so many people came out for the first time and discovered the park, discovered parks in general, um, had those first outdoor experiences. Um, and we have a feeling, we're pretty confident that many of them had great experiences and will be back this year and we'll bring more people with them this year. And so we're gearing up for an even busier um, season. And we're already seeing that now on weekends. If the weather is nice, parking lots will be full. I can imagine so, just because everybody just wants to get out of their house. Yep, and that's it. We're a place to go. There's no charge. Um, a few of our areas have like our beaches. It's $10 a day to get in, which is pretty inexpensive if you're coming from the city um, where you know, you can't even park somewhere for $10. And so um, it's pretty inexpensive, but most areas of the park are free. So it's it's something that even on uh, strapped incomes, which, you know, we know people are on um, having some difficult times with, with that kind of thing these days. And so it's a place that people can come. They don't have to pay anything. Um, you know, we've heard from people that they needed it for their mental health. They needed to be able to have some outdoor space for their physical health. Um, it was a place that they could exercise and walk, um, but also just sit and get their head straight. Um, and so being able to provide that for people, um, that's what we're here for. That's our mission. That's why we exist. And so, you know, yes, it's challenging, um, but we're up to the challenge and we enjoy finding ways to make that work. So that's what we're doing. I want to say thank you so much for be, uh, joining me today. I was fine. I'm really glad to help. Again, anytime I can help a fellow warrior, 